Hola, this is Enrique Morones of Gente Unida with another podcast of Buen Hombre, Magnificent Mujer. As you know, every week we have we picture, feature different people that are influence makers, people that are in the know, and people that you should know. Because these are people that, because of their work, they have influenced a lot of people. They are definitely uh, starfish in the starfish story about how one person can make a huge difference. And today we're going to be talking to somebody very special because this is a very special week. Uh, many of us are big fans of Chicano Park. Many of us have been to Chicano Park many, many times and we love Chicano Park. And this week there would have been Chicano Park Day. And uh, Chicano Park Day is still a day. However, because of the virus, things have changed, as has a lot of activities. We are dealing with issues sort of like uh, Comic-Con, the Latino Film Festival, uh, that have been postponed or canceled because of the virus. And, but we need to keep these issues alive. And today we have a great buen hombre, a friend, and his name is Rigoberto Reyes. Rigoberto, Rigo, welcome to Buen Hombre. I know you were also with Bad Hombre, but now you're with Buen Hombre. Okay. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you, Rico. How about yourself? I'm doing okay under the circumstances. You know, this virus right. thing is really, uh, really sad. And you see the best of times and the worst of times when, when situations like this happen. But you definitely represent the best of times. You'll see you and say, well, here's a guy that's done a lot of different things. And, uh, and that's the way, just like with Bad Hombre, I like to start with my guests. I like to ask them, who is Rigo Reyes? Maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you, Enrique, and uh, hopefully everybody's keeping safe and healthy and uh, wishing everybody the best, the best and the best luck and, and the best of everything. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, like you said before, my name is Rigoberto Reyes. Uh, most people know me as Rigo. I grew up here in San Diego. Uh, specifically, I grew up in the San Isidro area. I grew up there during the civil rights movement, late 60s, early 70s. So you could say I'm a product. I'm a product of, of that, of the movement, specifically here for us in our community, the Chicano movement. And having grown up in that era and still being involved has been probably the essence of who I am as a person. Uh, it's influenced me through all my life, and I'm still active today. And uh, I just hope that uh, our people take the time to learn about our own history, our own efforts, our own uh, luchas, if you will. Because sometimes we tend to forget, particularly the newer, the newer generations tend to forget as far as all the, all the struggles and all the luchas that we had throughout the years to get where we're at. Even today, we're still, we're, still, we're still in the lucha. All the issues that we're confronting are, are, are new, not new issues. These are issues that have been here for a long time, uh, probably be here for, for a long time still. And we hope to educate some of the youth uh, about uh, those efforts. So anyway, coming back to, to, to myself, like I said, I grew up in the San Isidro area. I became involved slowly listening in the background to Cesar Chavez as he was uh, organizing there in the San Isidro area. Uh, many people in that particular community and along Tijuana, uh, Cesar Chavez uh, was, uh, San Isidro was one of his uh, central points as far as organizing and organizing and educating people as far as what he was trying to do through the United Farm Workers. So as, as a child, uh, I remember playing marbles in, in the Civic Center there in San Isidro and in the background, listening to, to the rallies of Cesar Chavez and uh, not truly really knowing who Cesar was until uh, one of my uncles, actually, I overheard him talking about a, a struggle and, and about Cesar and, and because he was a farm worker, my uncle. Um, and it just kind of dawned on me, wait a minute, I just heard this guy. <laughs> I just heard him in the background as I was playing marbles and that's picked my curiosity to learn more about what he was doing and what he was organizing for. And obviously it had uh, an impact in my life and uh, I've been at it ever since. 
you've been at it and, and you've really done a, a great job in putting the, the words of that love is a word, is not just a word, it's an action. And you're an action type of person, uh, like Cesar was. And, and as you know, Cesar would always talk about that with the United Farm Workers or any movement, it's about the movement, not about the individual. So when the person is no longer here, like Cesar, the movement needs to go on. The movement needs to go on, and that's very, very important. And those are the lessons that you continue to teach the, the youth and others that the movement needs to, to the, needs to go on. It's not about uh, Rigo Reyes, it's about the movement. Correct. And, uh, and that's something that I always try to uh, practice as well. Having somebody like Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, Martin Luther King, uh, people like that as examples of uh, what we should be doing. And, uh, you know, of course, Dolores is still with us and she's continuing to do it. And, um, and it's, it's very, very important that we practice what we preach. And you're a person that I've gotten to know especially well in the last several years uh, with your work with uh, Via International and Chicano Park, uh, et cetera. And, and this being such a special week, one of the things that, that I would like to ask you, because there's several topics, uh, but one of them is, what does Chicano Park mean to you? That's a, that's a very good question. And, and I'm quite sure that uh, if you ask the same question to different people, they probably have a different answer for me. And I'll be very specific on this. And, and like I said to you earlier, uh, I grew up in San Isidro. And even at that time, back in 1970, I was 12, 13 years old, I remember. And I remember overhearing some of the older kids, some of the older youth at that particular time who were organizing. Uh, at that particular time, the Brown Berets were very active throughout the area. San Isidro had the, its, its own chapter of the Brown Berets. And as it turns out, one of the guys that uh, belonged to that group lived in behind my house, behind the projects where I used to live at. And actually he lived in the next door projects. And they used to get together there on his, uh, on his uh, small little uh, driveway and practice. And us as younger kids, uh, we used to go up there and, and look up to these guys, you know, they were a little older than we were. We were 12, 13 years old. These guys were already teenagers, 18, 19 years old. And we overheard him. We overheard heard him uh, talking about going to this place known as Logan Heights. I myself, I never known Logan Heights. I had no idea of a clue where Logan Heights was at. My friend, Lencho Flores, uh, who was, uh, he was, he was a vago, just, just as we all were all kind of vagos, but he was more vago than I was. And uh, he dared me saying, hey, let's, let's go, let's go check it out. So myself not knowing exactly how far, I thought it was going to take 10 minutes to get there on our bikes. I figured we'd jump on our bikes and get there in 10 minutes or whatever, half an hour maybe. Uh, a few hours later, we ended up in Logan Heights, not knowing the distances or where I was at. Needless to say, I was, uh, we both were, were, were there part of doing the takeover of Chicano Park. And that's something very important that people don't know or perhaps don't understand, that the takeover of Chicano Park did not last just one day. It was a 12-day. It was a 12-day uh, uh, initiative or, or, or effort, if you will. And I remember that the day that we went, uh, that, that we drove our bikes from San Isidro to Logan Heights, I'm quite sure it wasn't the first day. It was either the second, third day, maybe even the fourth day. Today, to this day, I don't know which, what, which one of the days it was, but needless to say, uh, it did impact me witnessing what people were doing there. People showing up with picks and shovels. I mean, people literally just, uh, Sing, sing it along the colores. I mean, all these, all these things that, that were uniting the people. And, and as a child, as, as a 12, 13 year old kid, it did have an impact in my life in a sense of, 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 of witnessing that. When you said the power of the people, and I think it, it, it impacted me so much that, uh, that I'm still there. 50 years later, I'm still there, you know? And, and even though I'm not from Logan Heights, uh, I never claimed to be from Logan Heights. Uh, Logan Heights was taken over, not necessarily just by people from Logan Heights. People from all over came over, from San Diego came over to support the effort. And that's important for people to understand and, and, and acknowledge 
that uh, it was it was it was a whole gente unida effort. Mm -hmm. Well said. And and uh, there's people that are gonna say, "What do you mean takeover? What, what takeover? What 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 was there? Why why was there a takeover? What was going on in in Logan Heights at that time?" Well, as you know, and 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 I I say this because I truly I truly relate to it because the same thing happened to us in San Isidro the abuses of the system. In this particular case, Logan Heights at one time was kind of like a segregated community. Uh, as a minority, that's the only place that you can live as Chicanos, as African Americans, even as Asian Americans, uh, you were kind of limited to that space. And if you noticed downtown San Diego, the closeness, the closeness to, to, to Logan Heights, anything and everything that they don't want in downtown San Diego gets pushed to the outskirts. In this particular case, Logan Heights. So therefore you have all this industry, including the shipyards, including the junkyards, including all the industry that uh, they don't want people, they don't want the, the, the average uh, visitor or the average tourist to see gets pushed to this particular low income communities. And essentially that's what happened to, to Logan Heights. So having said that, and having gone through all those uh, oppressions, if you will, uh, and also the development of San Diego as a whole with the construction of freeways and highways cutting right through our communities, both in Logan Heights and both in San Isidro. In Old Town National City, the same thing happened. And the ironic here thing here is that Never once was the community ever asked if this is what they wanted or this is what they needed. It was just done. It was done by eminent domain. It was, it was done because it was, it was the more under, uh, underserved communities. So our communities got cut. They got cut in half. Uh, that's exactly what happened to our community in San Isidro. As a matter of fact, coincidentally, the same week, the same week that uh, Chicano Park was being taken over, my family was being ousted of San Isidro. And actually that was one of the reasons that I decided to take my friend on a dare to go to Logan Heights because I wasn't sure if I was ever gonna see my friend again. So all those stories, all those histories are very important. And, and essentially coming back to, to, to the park, this particular community, Logan Heights have been promised the park. The park never got here. What we got was all the industry, all the freeways, not to mention the Coronado Bridge. So all that, all those, what, what that did, they just cut the community in half and then in quarters and so on and so forth. Whereas at one time, Logan Heights was one big, big barrio. Today, you probably have about eight, maybe even nine different barrios within what I was, what, what one time was Logan Heights, including Logan Heights, Barrio Logan, Sherman Heights, uh, Mountain View, in our time, it was called Shell Town, and all those other communities that that at one time were part of the of the big or the big uh, barrio of Logan Heights. Now it's all cut. It's all cut and divided. So coming back to Chicano Park, uh, the community had been in negotiations with the city of San Diego, and they had earmarked that particular uh, area as a potential park. As it turns out, uh, a gentleman by the name of Mario Torrer, uh, excuse me. Ma 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 uh, Mario, uh, he was walking on his way to, to, to City College and he saw, he saw what was going on there. Uh, there was construction going on at the park. It wasn't a park yet, it was just a piece of land. And uh, he decided to stop one of the bulldozers and I said, what are you guys doing? You guys doing the park? The guy kind of chuckled and said, nah, man, this is no park. This is gonna be a parking lot. It's gonna be a parking lot for the building over there there's gonna be a highway patrol station. Mario got very alarmed because uh, he had never heard about this and neither had the community ever heard about this. In many instances, Mario is regarded as the, as the Chicano Paul Revere, if you will, mm -hmm. because he took it upon himself to notify the community what was happening there in that land. He proceeded to walk over to City College and went straight to the Mecha office and informed many of the students, most who lived there in Logan Heights about what was happening there. 
within hours of the of the news, and you have to think in terms that uh, uh, the technology that uh, that was available or not available for that matter. Think in terms that this was before Twitter, before Facebook, before cell phones, before pagers, before all the items that all the gadgets that we have available today. Everything at that particular time was pretty much you know word of mouth. I mean, there was landlines, telephone landlines, and, and, and they were used to communicate to other parts of the city and letting people know what was happening there. And like I, st I stated earlier, within hours of the news, you had over two, 300 people that came together there at the area and literally took over, stopped the bulldozers from continuing working and literally built a, a human chain link fence all around it. And people start showing up with picks and shovels and plants and whatever they had and literally took over the land. That's why I stress that that particular part wasn't given to the community. It was taken over. It was taken over by activists, by residents, by people who care. And uh, that's why it's so important that 50 years later, it is still going on with a lot of issues. We're still confronting a lot of issues on a daily basis, but the beauty of it is that it's our part. It's a so very powerful. That, that's what Chicano Park means to me. I hope I answered your question. Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, the, I, li I love the, uh, the Mexican Paul Revere. Mario Solis, is that who you're talking about? Mario Solis, yeah. Yeah, so, so Mario Solis, the, uh, the Mexican Paul Revere, I can kind of see that, that image in my mind. I was not one of the people that was there. I grew up in the outskirts of uh, Logan Heights. I grew up in, in Golden Hill. Um, but I'm very familiar with the story because of people like you and others that, and, and, and the great work that uh, Tommy Camarillo does with, with the Chicano Park Steering Committee and, and, so, and Josie Palamantes and so many other people that have made sure that that story and that history is, uh, is known and, and to protect the park, our park. And when you talk about eminent domain, that's something that I can relate to totally because I have always been uh, uh, very active, as you know, on, on U.S., Mexico, uh, the border and, and issues like that. And I have often, when I lecture around uh, the world, talk about how the United States invaded Mexico and it stole half of the territory and the, and the justification, they use eminent domain. And, uh, and the fact that they had the God-given right, manifest destiny, that they had the God-given right to take that land as crazy as it seems. And there's some correlation between manifest destiny and eminent domain. And uh, yeah, it's, it's such a, such a tragic uh, way to do things. But as you said, that's still being done today. Correct. And, and, and for me, it's so important for youth to, to, to know and, uh, and understand that history, particularly because that generation, my generation or my, the generation a little older than I am, who were actually part of the takeover of this park is slowly disappearing. We're slowly disappearing. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years back, three years back, we lost four very important key people from the Chicano Park Steering Committee who are the stewards of Chicano Park and they have been active for, for all this time. And they all passed, passed, passed away in the same year. And, and to me personally, it was a big impact in a sense because uh, I know these four people very well and they're not, no longer here. And that's the reality that we're confronting that, that our generation, the generation that actually was part of that takeover is slowly disappearing. So therefore, it's our job to be sure that that story continues with the new generations. That's come with what we do, what we do, because uh, otherwise, unfortunately, if we don't do it ourselves, somebody from the outside is going to come and do it for us. And heavens knows why they're going to teach our youth, because they're going to see it from a different perspective. They're going to see it either from the academic perspective, from a research perspective, from, from a whole different perspective than somebody that lived it. So therefore for us, it's, it's very, very important that, uh, that we teach our youth the importance of, of, of pertaining and owning our own history, if that makes sense. 
it that makes a lot of sense. And it's so important what you mentioned about how other people want to write the history and we're not gonna allow that to happen. Um, we, I'm talking about the larger community. And, and, uh, and, and it's so important that we tell the story, especially when I say we, I'm talking about especially those that were involved in the takeover uh, that are still um, active today. Because as you said, people are passing and those stories are, are gone somewhat. There's other people that can kind of reflect and say, well, here's, here's this story and that story. And, and that's why it's so important that we do have these stories. Not too long ago, I was talking to a, a friend of mine. I was at a, a funeral of a, of a dear friend of mine, African-American gentleman that passed away. And so I was one of the few uh, Chicanos there, it was mostly African-Americans. And we were talking about Chicano Park. And he said, you know, I know that you've had a couple of uh, murals done there and so on and so forth. And I said, yeah, well, with organizations that I've been involved with, you know, we've had murals done and, and so forth. And he mentioned something that really caught my attention. He said, how come nothing uh, member, uh, you know, deals with the, the African-American community? We were there and I thought, that's a very good point. So I brought it to the attention of a few muralists and I go, I think we should have a, maybe later on, you know, through the committee and so forth, talk about that, that maybe there could be a mural, there should be a mural, uh, in my opinion, to, to remember some of those African-Americans and some of the other communities that were there, uh, because it is something that's very important in our history and in the history of other communities. You keep on saying Logan Heights, that's the way I grew up. But now very rarely do people call it Logan Heights. Now it's Barrio Logan. Uh, right. And, uh, and that's something that you know, has changed. It's changed through time. But a lot of communities uh, have been affected. And, um, and that's why it's so important that we ask a lot of people that, that are still with us uh, what Chicano Park means to them so they can share stories. And one of the, one of the first times I was ever there, uh, that was many, many pounds ago, because I used to be a distance runner, and, uh, and I ran a lot. And they had, they had a race called the Barrio Run. It was the first one they ever held. And the finish line was Chicano Park. And I was one of the top, you know, I was a pretty good runner. So anyways, so maybe there's 50 or 60 runners. And as we're coming in, and I was, there was a really good runner who was like the best runner in town. And he was the, the leading. And I was battling for second place with these two other guys. And I remember as I was running in, um, sort of by where that the parking lot is on Logan, that's where the finish line was. I had a, my regular coach from St. Augustine High School, and I had a personal coach. And my personal coach was standing there, and he was signaling, signaling, this is the finish line. So I ran really fast, and I ran across, and I thought I had second place. And then these other two guys kept on running for about another, I don't know, five yards. And that's where the real finish line was. So by the time I recovered, I came in fourth place. But I remember I was going, oh, yeah, uh, Chicano Park. And, of course, I had driven by there many, many times. I had been there a few times. Because I didn't live that far from there. And, uh, but later and later in my life, I got very involved and did a lot of activities and still do a lot of activities at that very sacred place known as Chicano Park. And, and one of the things that and we we're planning to invite a lot of people to this podcast, Buen Hombre and Magnificent Mujer, Chicano Park Steering Committee people and others. And it's such a diverse group, whether it's dancers, muralists, students there's so many people we want to be able to hear their stories and their testimonies during this coming year the 50th anniversary and Rigo I know that there's something uh I think Josie Talamantes is spearheading it with other people and it's the Chicana Park uh Museum and Cultural Center and, and I know you're involved in that tell us a little bit about that what, what is that all about sure uh Incidentally, this, the building that I was talking about earlier that uh, eventually was going to be turned into a highway patrol station is actually the same building that we're talking about. It's the old building that at one time was the Chicano Federation. Uh, for many years, it was the Cesar Chavez Continuation School or, or, or college. And that particular building is the building that we had acquired, we, we, we've uh, negotiated with the city of San Diego to take it over as the Chicano Park Museum and Cultural Center. I am a proud member of the board of directors of this initiative. Uh, Josie Talamantes, who you mentioned earlier, is the chair and she's been instrumental, basically. She's, she's, she's spearheaded this whole effort. 
with the idea basically of bringing something of this man into a museum for our community. And not just a museum, but a cultural center with like different activities that, uh, that uh, our community take advantage of. Uh, this particular center has been in negotiations for going on three years. We've been established as a, as a 501c3 nonprofit organization going probably in uh, four years now that we have been established as a, as a, as a nonprofit. Uh, we are in negotiations right now with the city of San Diego and they're finishing the last touches before it's turned over to us, to, 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 to the community. Uh, there is millions of dollars, at least $5 million worth of renovation that needs to, that, 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 that some that is happening through the city and some that we still need to uh, fundraise for uh, in order to, to bring a high quality museum to the barrio. So for us, it is a very important venue. Uh, we were kind of like hoping that uh, this spring we'll, we'll, be, we'll open the doors, particularly we're shooting for Chicano Park. But unfortunately, because of the virus and everything that's going on right now, that has kind of halted that, that, that initiative for right now. Uh, we're hoping that maybe in the fall, but uh, it's coming. It's coming, and I can't say it's coming, but it's here. If you want to visit us, you could visit us in our website. We do have a website to get more information. People want to get involved, people want to donate, et cetera. We're very much open to that. Uh, I think it's something that is very needed in this community and right in the heart of the barrio, highlighting Chicano Park and all these contributions, historical contributions that, uh, that we contributed over the years. I feel that uh, going back to the original question you asked me earlier, as far as what the Chicano Park means, for me to, to narrow it down in one particular word, it means resistance. Resistance against the establishment that has oppresses for so many long, for so long, for so many years. I hope I answer your question, Enrique. And, oh, that's a, and, and that's a great word too, resistance. Um, I'm gonna ask people like in one word, uh, what, what, what does it mean? Um, now, so this museum, which is fantastic, uh, that is being developed, and of course, Josie has done so much work, not only at the museum in Chicano Park, but in giving Chicano Park the stature that it deserves and, and, and so forth. As a uh, national landmark, yes, definitely. She was, she was the key, she was the key driver behind that. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Nobody has uh, an idea, unless you've done it, and most of us have never done it. I've never even come close to put in that type of work to get something like that done. Correct. That's unbelievable. Correct. Um, yeah, I just saw her the other day. We were down in uh, the Chicano Park under the kiosk filming a, 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 a document. Um, but uh, yeah, she does tremendous work. And one of the things I wanted to ask, because we plan and hope to have her as one of our guests as a magnificent mujer uh, and others, we want to see what we can do as gente unida and when I'm a magnificent mujer to help raise funds for the Chicano Park uh, Museum and Cultural Center. So we want to put the link of the uh, cultural center, of the Museum and Cultural Center, um, and see how we can do that, you know, during the entire year. This is a long year, and I know there's going to there's gonna be events, but there's also going to be virtual events. I, I believe the Chicano Park Steering Committee is doing something that's fantastic. Um, so we, we want to know from the public ideas people might have on how we can help and, and other organizations can help. We personally want to do something with this podcast to help raise funds for the museum because it's so important. And uh, you know better than most, because I've seen you do it, the importance of talking to our youth, talking to our youth and the youth groups because there's a lot of misinformation out there. And it's our fault as the elders because we never told them. You know, how could they not know this? How could they not know that? And I'm sitting there thinking, why would they know that? Uh, one thing that comes to mind was, I remember one of the few times that I actually was, uh, it was in the White House, and it was President Obama, Dolores Huerta, President Calderon of Mexico, and a handful of others that were in there, maybe 10 or 15 of us. And I could tell that when uh, President Calderon was talking to Dolores Huerta, he really didn't know who she was. And also I could tell when President Obama uh, was talking to one of us, uh, he didn't know 
some of the things that we were referring to with uh, some you know icons in our community in the Chicano community. And I was when I was thinking that I was thinking it's not their fault, it's our fault because we haven't educated them about it. You know, they're, they're, and we need to do a better job with that, educating our elders and educating our youth. And the museum, the museum is such a, a perfect place because like the four people that you mentioned that were pillars in Chicano Park, we need to have those testimonies recorded, their histories recorded and have it someplace because uh, we're gonna be gone. We're gonna be gone. You and I are closer to that than the youth for sure, uh, but it could be any moment. It could be any moment, especially with things that are happening today. So we need to have a place where that is recorded, where it's documented, where you have uh, videos of them or their writings. And so we want to be able to help out with the museum. Do you know off the top of your head the, the website or where people can get information right now? Sure. Uh, there's two two websites that I, that I will refer people to. Obviously, the uh, Chicano Park Museum and Cultural Center dot com, dot, dot org will be one that will take you straight to our website and also through the Chicano Park Steering Committee uh, website. Those, and you mentioned earlier something about, about uh, the virtual. Yes, we are developing at this point as we speak right now. Uh, we're, we're, de we're developing a series of educational uh, series throughout this week, coming week because we are commemorating the, the 50th anniversary on April 22nd. But uh, starting April 21st, all the way through through Saturday, I believe, uh, we're developing sort of like a series of different uh, presentations on different topics relating to Chicano Park. Uh, and people that want to get more information, uh, they could they, they could uh, go to any of the links to either either the Chicano Park Steering Committee or or the uh, museum, the Chicano Park Museum and Cultural Center, where they could you, you could find the links there to take you to these. Uh, to these virtual uh, sessions that we're we're planning, again right now we're 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 in the process of still uh, tying all all the knots, and hopefully by tomorrow or or the day after we should have everything, or the link should should be already ready. So for right. all those that want to learn more about uh, about the efforts, uh, just, I I would I would definitely uh, suggest and 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 advise people to 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 tap into that. Well, our podcast uh, Buen Hombre is on Tuesdays. So, so actually, that information should already be up. So right. we'll post that so people can look at it because it's uh, when we do the podcast on Tuesdays, uh, it'll be when Chicano, uh, you know, which is great, which is the day before the actual Chicano Park Day anniversary. So that's great that Chicano Park Steering Committee has already thought of this and is already working on this, and it's already up. Yeah, we've got to see what we can do. We, we, we can all do to contribute and participate in uh, making sure that uh, this museum and cultural center is, is the best that it could be. It's, it's great that it's already so close to completion and the hard work of, of so many different people. Now behind you, you have a, a, a mural. I could see it a, a bit and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the, the artist that did this mural is the same artist that I've been involved with. I've worked with several of them. I don't paint uh, at all. But uh, Salvador Barajas, the uh, the muralist, one of the many many muralists of the dozens of murals that are in uh, in Chicano Park. Tell us a, about a little bit first of all about the mural, and then Amigos, the Amigos Car Club. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure, uh, I've been part of the Amigos. I'm I'm one of the founding members of the Amigos Car Club. Uh, actually, today, today is our 43rd anniversary. We were established back in 1977, uh, April 18th, 1977. And uh, prior to that, we had another car club that uh, started back in 1972. So we don't claim those years from 1972 because we were known on a different name. We were known as the casinos, the casinos from the south side of San Diego, uh, which evolved into the Amigos back in, in 1977. And we've been very active in the community, particularly as it pertains with Chicano Park. Actually, Amigos is the host of the annual uh, commemoration of Chicano Park. We've been doing it since, uh, since the mid eighties. We're the one that hosts the, the exhibition every year. We welcome anywhere from 300 to 250 cars every year. 
uh, for 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 the commemoration of the of the park. It's uh, one of the biggest celebrations uh, throughout the city. We have an average maybe about fifteen thousand people each time that uh, that that we have this uh, this event. And again, Amigos is uh, Amigos Car Club is is the uh, is the host is is the coordinator of this of, of the of the car show aspect of the uh, of the event. Uh, like I said, I, I've been I've been involved since the very beginning. I was president for uh, I lose track, twenty five years or so. And uh, the last uh, the last twenty years, I've been more training others to 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 as far as the skills that it takes to organize. And uh, like I said, it's 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 we're very proud to be part and and everything that we contribute to the community. The the pillar that you see behind me is uh, a mural, and you're Ryan the Ryan the a spot, uh, Salvador Barajas, Sal, uh, an old friend of mine, and and I invited him to participate on this uh, on this effort. It took us uh, two years of fundraising for it, and uh, it took him close to four months to complete. It was done and was it was in, uh, inaugurated last year, November of 2019, and right now it's one of the newest murals at Chicano Park. As we speak, there is some other ones that are coming up uh, uh, as, as we speak, and they'll, they'll be the newer ones, but uh, they're still in the process. They're still in the process. If you go to Chicano Park, this is, is the newest to date right now. So again, we're very proud of that effort. It's kind of like a welcoming card to Chicano Park because we're so close to the freeway, this particular pillar. And like I said, uh, with the efforts of our, of our car club and the efforts of, uh, of Sal Barajas, who, who literally did the whole job himself with the assistance of, 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 of some help. Uh, Liz, Liz, Liz Corona, as for example, and, and Patricia Guayo were, were assisting him on, on, this, on this process. Uh, but again, most of, the, most of the effort was, was actually done by, uh, by Sal. And again, my, my hat goes off to Sal. He's, he's, a, he's a gentleman, he's a professional, and he's as uh, professional as you can get. He is, and, and one thing that, I don't know if you know this about Sal, because he did the murals uh, that, that we commissioned with my uh, previous organization that I retired oh. from, of Border Angels. We have the one that says, one of my favorite sayings, Amor si se puede, where we have that on the, uh, on the wall of the restroom, and then the other one, which is closer to the kiosk, uh, no border wall, um, and uh, that he did those. He did those murals. One of the things that you might not know about him or the audience is that he's a veteran. He was in the Air Force and he used to box. Did you know yes. that he used to box? You don't yes. want to get mad because that guy's a boxer. You don't want yeah, to get yeah. mad at him. He's a mild mannered man, but he's a boxer. Yes, a boxer. yes, yes, he is. And also for, for people's information, also, he's one original muralist of Chicano Park. He was right. involved in the first mural that was done at Chicano Park, which is known as the historical mural. He was part of that, uh, of that crew. So he's been at this for, for a long time. He has, and he's one of the people that, uh, he, he lives close to the, uh, in Golden Hill where, where I grew up, and uh, we want to have him as a guest on uh, Buen Hombre in the, in the this coming year as, uh, as the work that he has done and so many other muralists. And, and, and then, the, uh, but getting back to the lowriders, um, that is in, incredible uh, on Chicano Park Day. When you see all those lowriders parked there, and uh, the, the value of the beauty, but the value of those cars, some of those cars, they gotta be worth over $100,000 with the work that they put into them, the painting and the engine, and, and uh, it's just beautiful to see. Yes, definitely. And, and for me, I've been involved with different projects, uh, not just to do with Chicano kind of Park, but uh, along also the lowrider culture aspect of it. Uh, the last few years, since 2013, we uh, developed uh, a film, a film telling the history of the car clubs here in, in, in San Diego, dating back all the way to the 1950s, and we took it all the way to the mid 80s. It's a documentary that's known as Everything Comes from the Streets. It's a one hour documentary in conjunction with USD, Professor Alberto Pulido, was actually the director. I happen to be one of the one of the uh, producers of this um, of this film. It's an educational film, 
uh, again, we were trying to capture the history precisely for the same reason that I mentioned before, what's happening to the elders of Chicano Park. Very similarly, it's happening to the elders of the low rider movement here in San Diego. Many of the pioneers are also slowly disappearing. So for that reason, I felt it was very important for us to capture those histories before, before it's too late. So we were able to do that. And then uh, right after we did the, uh, the documentary, uh, many people approached us because some people felt left out saying that if we were there too, what about us? So we took it upon ourselves to start writing a book. And we did write a book, it's called San Diego Lowriders. And we were able to interview, I think it was 27 different car clubs. Again, dating back to the 1950s and taking it to the mid 1980s. The reason we did that is, is our focus, we had to be realistic as far as the resources that we had available and also trying to capture those particular histories because again, that is the generation that's, that's disappearing. That, that is the, the pioneers, that is the pioneers generation. And if we don't get their histories now, tomorrow might be too late. That's the time we focus on that. We're hoping that either ourselves or somebody else, maybe the new generations, want to take it on from there. Maybe take on the history from the mid 80s to the present time. Uh, we're very open to that, to support those initiatives. Uh, I would like to do it myself, but you know, because I am so involved with so many different things, it's kind of hard for me to find the time to, uh, to invest into it. So uh, uh, I, would I would definitely support those efforts. Absolutely, everything comes from the streets. That's a great name. And Alberto Pulido is another person we plan to have on Buen Hombre in the future. And uh, I know that he's a professor at my alma mater, the University of San Diego, and, and uh, he does great work. I saw him down there not too long ago. I forget what we were doing down there, and I, and I saw him with a group of students. He was taking a group of students to, to give a tour. So, so people that do want to have a tour uh, of Chicano Park, uh, how, how do they do that? Who, who do they contact? They could contact the Chicano Park Steering Committee through, through the website, through, through Facebook. And, and set up a time. We usually request, I'm actually one of the uh, tour guides. Uh, Alberto Polido actually is the coordinator. He's the one that uh, gets all the messages and then from, from, from whatever the, the uh, request, timing and, and, and days and so on and so forth, then we get, we, we get volunteer. And that's important, very important for people to know that everything that we do, the Chicano Park State Committee does, we all volunteers. None of us get paid for what we do. A lot of people think, yeah, you guys, you guys make the money, you guys get grants and all that sort of stuff. We don't. Right. Everything is done by, by people that really care. And like we say in the barrio, lo hacemos de corazón. De corazón from the heart. Now, one of the things that uh, there in, in Barrio Logan, there's a lot of great uh, uh, facilities and so forth. And one of the newer ones in the last five years or so uh, is uh, Bread and Salt with our friend, uh, James Brown. And so I was at one of those events, and actually, as you know, when, uh, when, uh, we'll talk about Via International in a little bit, but one of the times that we were collaborating, you mentioned to me that you needed a new place, Via International needed a new place, and I go, hey, I got a friend that just, uh, you know, they have a, a place, maybe you guys can, can go there, and that, and that is where Via International is, is now, and that's great. Uh, but, but I wanted to talk about one of the events I was at in, in, in Bread and Salt, you were giving a talk and there was this giant photograph behind you and, and you said, yeah, I go, I go, that's beautiful. What's that from? And he goes, and you said, oh, I was just in Japan. And I go, you were in Japan. And tell us a little bit about that, about that trip to Japan. And, and uh, that is really, really interesting. Yes, well, thank you for saying that, Enrique. And yes, and again, th thank you for the, the connection that uh, it was thanks to you that we ended up there in South uh, Via. And, uh, and we're still there. It's, it's been almost seven years, going on eight years since that. But uh, yes, as far as our Japan, uh, Japan invitation, if you will. Uh, and actually, I was somewhat reluctant as, 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 as far as attending this invitation. And I was kind of like uh, pushed and, and, and uh, advised by, by my membership to, to attend. So uh, we decided to go. This, this event was being organized in Nagoya, Japan. And it was, re, it was being promoted as the largest car show in the world. And 
Actually, it was. No ride, no ride car show? Or? No ride a car show. No ride a car show in the world. I didn't realize, I mean, I knew that the low rider scene had been uh, expanded, but I didn't realize to what extent. For something that I saw grow from the, from the barrio, from our backyards, from our alleys, uh, to now being in the mainstream, nationally and internationally. Uh, for me, it was pretty eye-opening in a sense, because uh, again, I come from the roots. I come from the, from, from the beginnings, from the pioneers, when uh, nobody will, will even give us a day of time to where it is now. That now it's, 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 it's acceptable. Now it's all over the news. It's all over, it's, it's, it's all over social media and so on and so forth. So anyway, we were invited to go to, to this uh, event in, in Japan. And like I said, I went reluctantly. Uh, they, did, they did help us bring one of our cars here from San Diego, one of, one of our amigos' cars. And they asked us where or what display you guys want us to, to provide for you. And we told them, you know what, uh, we're not Hollywood. <laughs> we're not an LA club, we're a San Diego club, we're humble. We want something very, very uh, normal, very, you know, we don't want bells and whistles. We want, just give us a corner and we'll set up there, we'll bring our own display. For to our surprise, when we get there, uh, we asked, okay, where, where's, our, where's our area at? So he pointed out, we're about, I don't know, three, 400 uh, yards away. And he pointed out, so we started walking that way. And as we started getting closer, and there was a good group of us, because there's actually 12 of us that went from our car club and a delegation of 30 of us that went from San Diego. So there was a, there was a big group, it was a big group of us that, that went overall. But our particular club, because we were trying to get the car ready to, to, for the setup, for the, for the event, for the car show. So we started getting closer, we started getting closer, walking towards where he pointed. And to my surprise and to everybody's surprise, I mean, we got closer and closer and it was actually a picture. It was a, a canvas picture, nine feet by 30 feet as a backdrop, as a background of, of where we're going to be at. And for me, it had such an impact. It had a, such an impact in my, in, in my heart. At that moment, I can say, I'm, I'm half a, half world around the world, and I felt at home in a sense because they brought Chicano Park to to Japan. So, frankly, I lost it, and not only did I lose it, many of my friends lost it because I mean, just the the respect and the uh, the thought that they have for us. That particular canvas is actually a picture of Chicano Park of one of the pillars, and uh, it really that kind of bought me in a sense as far as all the reluctance that I have on going to Japan and the love and the respect that they have for the culture and for low riding. Uh, it was, it was, uh, it was part of the best experience of my life to tell the truth. So, uh, in turn, after the event was over, uh, the promoter, he, he became a good friend of ours. He says, you know what, this is our, our present to you. We want you to take this back home with you, which we did. And my, my club decided to, to donate it to me. And I in turn said, well, you know what? This belongs someplace else. It doesn't belong with me. It belongs in the museum. And I turned it on and, and donated it to the, to the museum. So that, that piece now belongs to the, to the Chicano Park Museum and Culture Center because the history that it has behind it, the meaning that it has behind it, and the, um, the love and respect that coming from a Japanese friends, I think is, is something to be shared something to be shared. Like I said, it made, it, it made my day. It made me proud. Like I said, all the, all the questions, all the reluctance that I had as far as thinking that these folks from halfway around the world are trying to steal our culture, are trying to steal our, our style and so on and so forth. You know, that went out the window because uh, these people approach it with the utmost respect and love for the same culture that we love and respect. So yeah, it was, it was a great experience. That is a great story. I, I teared up right now when you were sharing that. Uh, I love Japan, and uh, one of the many things that I love about Japan and the Japanese culture, their gentleness and uh, their humbleness. And here I am, still upset about 1846, and I will always be upset about how the United States invaded our land, Mexico, and stole half the territory. I'm very upset about that still today. But I realize there's nobody alive today that was, that was uh, involved in that, um, but it's very upsetting to me. Well, here's the Japanese culture where the United States 
bombed and, 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 and horrifically killed millions of people because the, the bombings that, that uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, um, there wasn't millions of people killed in that instant, close to a million, but eventually because of the, the consequences, yet you never hear them, and, and there are people alive today that were you know, present when that happened, you don't hear that rancor from them. You don't hear that. Right. You know, here they're, they're, they're a strong ally to the United States. Um, and, and, and that was 100 years after what the United States did to Mexico. And I've always admired that. One of the many things that I admire about the Japanese culture, and I remember when I was there, I got to go there a couple of times, and I have a, a dear friend that lived over there that's from uh, Mexico City. His name is Horacio Reyes. And uh, so he took me to this area and there was all these uh, like rock and rollers. I don't know if you went there, it's in Tokyo. And um, so there was these Japanese people that love the rock and roll culture. So it was kind of similar to what they've done with the, the, the lowriders. So they had people dressed up as Elvis Presley, the Beatles, Rolling Stones, et cetera. And it was fantastic. And, they, and there was an appreciation of, of their love for the culture. And I think that's terrific. And there's also a mariachi band. I think it's called El Sol. And they are a, a Japanese mariachi right. band. I don't know if yes, you've yes. ever heard of them. Yeah, yes, cool. I just love that. Yeah, yes. It, it's a wonderful culture. And, and there's wonderful cultures like that around the world. There's 200 countries in the world, give or take a few. Literally 200 countries. Mm -hmm. That's how many countries there are. And all of them are wonderful. All the people from all these different countries have some beautiful, beautiful values. And uh, there's no country that's greater. They're all equally great. Some might be wealthier, and some might have a more powerful military, for example. But all 200 countries are equally important. So it was great that you were able to have that experience with the Japanese culture, and that you and your team and your friends and so forth brought our culture to them so they could see that and expand that. So that, that's really fantastic. And. Um, you mentioned, or I mentioned, VIA International, where you work, community outreach and so forth, and you, you've all been doing a, a wonderful job. I realize that my friend John Panastel is there now uh, also. So, so tell us about what is VIA International? Well, VIA International is a, it's a nonprofit organization. We focus in community development. That's, that's how the whole emphasis of our organization. I came on board 35, going to 36 years now, working with this organization. And one of the reasons that they hired me is because they were looking into changing the methodology of the organization, particularly their approach of working with the community. Prior to that, they have been working more in a direct aid type of approach of working in communities, particularly in the border area, particularly in Tijuana, Tecate, and Mexicali. Uh, one of the reasons that they hired me is because my experience that I have a community organizing here in San Diego and promoting what we call self-sufficiency or self-reliance. And essentially that's the approach that, uh, that the organization wanted to take. So they, they, it was one of the reasons that I got hired to try to change that, uh, that approach of working with the community from a direct aid organization to a community development organization. And I've been at it ever since. So uh, for me, a lot of stuff that I learned from working in community here in Logan Heights, uh, working with youth, working with, uh, with activism and so on and so forth, I was able to transmit that across the border as far as community or organizing skills to the point that uh, we develop a whole program for what we call over there promotores comunitarios, which is kind of pretty, pretty similar to, to community organizers here. Uh, taking the reality of the border, adjusting it to the reality of the border. Many of the methodologies that we used were methodologies that were used throughout Latin America and Africa, but we adapted them from a rural setting to an urban setting to a border setting. So all those were challenges that we were able to develop, develop throughout the years. And uh, that's the essence of the work that we do. Uh, we work with communities, marginal communities on both sides of the border, uh, particularly teaching them techniques as far as community organiz organizing is concerned. So we do it through, through programs that uh, are very acceptable in the communities, 
in our particular case, what has worked for us has been nutrition and ecology. So we use that as the vehicle, but always with the idea of people at the grassroots level, give them the tools for them to be able to identify and define what the issues, the real issues are within the communities and to actually give them the tools to do something about it. So in, in a nutshell, that's, that's, that, that's one of the components of, uh, of what VIA does. Another component, which one that I've been working probably the last six, seven years, focusing a little bit more attention to. Uh, prior to that, somebody else was doing it, but now I'm doing it, which is more educating visiting groups as far as the reality of the border. Uh, there's a lot of misconception as far as what the border is. A lot of it is based on what uh, the current administration says or, or media and social media and so on and so forth. But for us, it's very important for people to come and look for themselves and learn for themselves from the people that are actually living the experience. Somebody from the East Coast has a, a whole different idea <clears throat> as far as what immigration is, what the border is. So part of the work that we do is we introduce them to the reality of the border. By that, I mean, bring them to Chicano Park, learn about Chicano Park, the efforts of Chicano Park, learn about Friendship Park, uh, even learn from the Border Patrol, the, the whole component as far as how they see the issue on the topic of migration and immigration. Of course, from the law enforcement side of the, of the coin, and then on the other side, you know, introduce them to people that are more in the human, human rights side of it. People such as you, Enrique, or other folks that are, that are working more in the human rights aspect of the, of the topic. So by the time the visitors get, they leave here, they leave with a more solid idea, with a more solid uh, uh, idea of our reality, which is very different from what they heard in the media. It's very different from what the administration is saying. So for me, that's been my, my, one of my focuses within VIA in the past, uh, in the past six, seven years. Uh, and for me, I, I say this because a lot of the visitors come from different universities throughout the country, but many of them are more, more uh, privileged, if you will, more privileged uh, uh, students that Realistically, these students are the future leaders of this country. They're probably more than likely the new, the, 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 the next senators or the next congressmen or these people to be in power. Not that, not that nobody from our communities are gonna be able to, to do that, but the chances are that these kids are probably are, have a stronger chance than we do because they have the resources we don't. So if I can make an impact on these visiting students, on these visiting kids, kids that, that come and visit us and, and have them remember what they learned here from us. I think we're contributing with a little solid grain, a grain of salt as far as the future for this country. So in a nutshell, that's, that's a part of the, of the work that we do with VIA. We are also always looking for support for donations and, and things of that nature because as any nonprofit, all nonprofits are struggling nowadays. I've been working for nonprofits 40 something years out of my life. And it's always an uphill battle when you work for, for a nonprofit organization. Uh, we, we always lack resources. So if any people out there are interested in supporting us, you know, we're more than open. And again, you can find us at viainternational.org on our website if people are interested in supporting us. Yeah, they do uh, really, really good work. I noticed you have the VIA t-shirt on. Um, yeah, so, so that's, that's fantastic. And oftentimes you have brought the student groups uh, to to me and to organizations I've been affiliated with, in order to to take them to actually see the realities, whether it's going to Friendship Park where I've been going since the 90s, or going to the border, or going to do some of these actions, a day labor outreach, put water in the desert, and so forth. Very very powerful. And when I retired last November, November 1st from from Border Angels. Uh, there was three main things that I wanted to focus on. And one of them was, I like you, I'm getting older, so I'm physically limited on being able to actually lead groups walking through the desert or things like that because of my health and my knees. However, uh, now we're busier than ever, or at least uh, gente unida, with these school groups. And so we were focusing a lot on education. I continue to go all over and, and, and lecture about uh, human rights and the realities of the border. Just a few months ago, I was in Berlin actually with the other Mario, Mario Torero, 
and we were talking about building bridges, not walls. So we're a lot of education by going to places across the world and talking to students or having students come here. We get a, a lot of stu student groups. Another issue, very, very important to all of us, and I know you're, you're helping us with this, is to make sure that in November, people vote. People have got to vote. And, uh, and if you can't vote because you're not 18, don't have papers, you know people that can vote. And it's very, very, very important that we vote and then a third is the, uh, the, the, you know, very active with migration, especially the children. We recently did a caravan from uh, Tijuana to San Quentin, Baja California, and we brought a thousand toys to a thousand children uh, because for us, a society is judged on how we treat our children. And it's very important, especially in these times with the, the fear that they see worldwide because of the virus, the negative things that they hear from this current administration in the US, uh, we gotta love them even more. And, and love is an action, not just the word. And when you bring these groups, or when we've had groups, they do definitely come back, a changed people, because they've seen the realities. And like I tell them, and I know you've told them, because I, I say the same thing, uh, sometimes they come from really conservative families. So I, I tell these students, when you go back, you're not gonna be able to change the minds necessarily of your parents or grandparents but you can at least influence them somewhat. But what gives me a lot of hope is these people, the youth, the youth, because our generation, we've blown it. We haven't done a good enough job, but I have a lot of faith in a better world because of the youth. So these, these, uh, these groups coming are, are so important to, uh, to uh, all of us. And, and you mentioned Friendship Park. Lately, I've been dealing uh, somewhat with the new uh, people that are in charge here of, uh, of some of the border policies, because we definitely, and I assure you, we definitely will open that door of hope again. You know, that I was able to do that uh, under my leadership six times, where we got the door of hope at Friendship Park open, and children were able to hug their parents or their grandparents, because that touch is so important, even if it's only for three minutes. And now we can't you know, forget about opening the door. We can't even touch a lot of these people because of, of the virus and we need to respect that. We need to keep our social distance like we're doing right now. Uh, we need to wear our masks. I know that when we're out in public, we're wearing our masks. We need to listen to the experts, whether it's the uh, doctors or the, the scientists because uh, this too shall pass. But, uh, but we got to be intelligent about it and, and show, uh, be a good example. And, and Rigo, you've always been, a good example of what it's like to be uh, a buen hombre. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, the work that you're doing, you have an incredible history. And uh, just to bring, bring it back home to where, where we started, here we are celebrating Chicano Park all year, 50th anniversary. We, and we wanna make sure people know about the stories and the testimonials. So, so we, we're gonna see what we can do throughout the year about uh, supporting Chicano Park Museum and Cultural Center that people can donate to, uh, find out more information, contact the Chicano Park Steering Committee, because uh, it's so important that we know our history. And uh, you don't, you know, you gotta know your history because um, some people ask, why is this going on? Well, you gotta know the roots of a lot of these issues. And Chicano Park to me is uh, the heart and soul of, the, uh, of this region's community. And it's just such a such a special place. Rigo, are there some final thoughts that you'd like to share before I, I ask I ask everybody or most people a question at the end? But before that, are there some final thoughts that you'd like to share about where we are today as we're celebrating Chicano Park uh, this week and all year? Uh, but in general, anything you'd like to share with us? Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Enrique, for this opportunity. Uh, like I said before, uh, it's always a pleasure to. Uh, chat with you and, and, and have access to other, other folks that listen to you. Uh, you hit it right in the nail. I mean, April 22nd, 1970 is the actual commemoration of the takeover of Chicano Park. Uh, virtually, we're trying to reach as many people as we can. At this point, uh, we do not claim that it's canceled. We say it's postponed because our, our aim is still to have it sometime this year, we hope. Oh, good. It's, too, it's, it's, too, it's too hard to, to note because until, until the powers that be uh, tell us that, that it's safe, uh, that's one thing that we do support, that, that we need to be safe. 
yes. you know, the whole economic issues, so on and so forth. I mean, it's important, but I think the health is more important than, than anything. Uh, we just want to be sure that all the people know the efforts of, of all the people, all the fallen brothers and sisters that are no longer with us. They not, not might not be here in, in, in body, but they're here in spirit. They're here in spirit and love and all the dedication they did throughout the years. Again, uh, people such as, uh, I mean, I start naming names. I mean, Chunky, Howard Holman, Rebecca Romero, Rico Bueno, many people that have already passed away and they're no longer with us, but they were part, they were very important part of the takeover in the continuing history of Chicano Park. Gracias. Uh, yes, thank you very much. And, and um, yeah, that was a good closing statement. So, so Rigo, uh, oftentimes I'll ask somebody, and this is a question that is, is important. What does love mean to you? What, what does love mean to you? Hmm. Love means caring. Caring. I remember this quote that uh, when I was in high school, one of my only favorite teachers that I had, I wasn't too good of a, uh, of a student back then, and I really liked school because uh, I, I felt I wasn't getting the right, proper education, but uh, my English teacher, uh, had uh, a poster as you came in into his into his class. It was an English class, and we used to do a lot of literature. He used to read a lot, but he was he was kind of like a progressive guy. And the poster, remember, there was an image. It was an image. I don't remember the exact the image, but in the topics he just gave a damn. And I think that's the best way I could, you know, for lack of a better term, love is caring. Love is giving a damn. That's right. And and love is an action, not just a word. And you're a person full of actions from uh, Nagoya, Japan to, to San Isidro to Chicano Park. Muchas gracias. You gracias. do incredible work. We're going to continue to to stay in touch as, as we have uh, and, and for a long time. So if you want to hear this podcast, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, tune in. And of course, buenhombre.org magnificentmuhead.org and we're going to continue the entire year of this 50th anniversary to have some of the people that uh, who have such incredible stories about Chicano Park and in general about making yourself available to, to uh, hopefully let other people know the story about love being an action not just the word the fact that love has no borders and that this year is going to be the most important election of our lifetimes. And we all got to participate. And we all got to participate in making this world a better place as you have, Rigo. So, muchísimas gracias. Adelante. Y que viva Chicano Park. Que viva. Gracias.